Okay, friends, good morning. This is Alex. Uh, I've had some <clears throat> some interest in the recent presentation that I presented at the ULDRA at the Herpetology Congress in the Americas recently um, and wanted to share that with some of you guys. Also, get, get your feedback, any thoughts, um, constructive criticism concerning stats and my methodology approach, etc. would be great. Um, and yeah, just wanted to share with you guys some of the work I've been doing because I think it's really, really interesting. So I'm going to go through the slides, explain in English, um, and yeah. So the presentation I gave was <clears throat> about the ecology of Bothracophia snakes in the region of the upper Ansu where I've been working. Um, Bothracophia is a genus of six snakes native to South America. In Ecuador, there are three species, uh, Cambali, and then on the eastern side of the Andes, Microphthalmus and Hyaprora. Um, these are stout-bodied terrestrial pit vipers that coil when they hunt, um, possibly actively hunting as well. I haven't ruled that out entirely. Uh, relatively small snakes, kind of like a tropical copperhead, you can think of it. Um, and Sumac Calcia Reserve is right there on that star, right? Basically, at the meeting point of the ranges of the Microphthalmus, the Hyprora. Now, the Hyprora is a lowland species found down in the Amazon basin. Microphthalmus is a high, highland species, more in the cloud forest. And Sumac Calcia is at an elevation of 1,440 meters. And it is right where the two zones meet. So this is actually a zone of sympatry where both species can be found. I'm going to talk about that more um, later on in the presentation. Just a little bit of background. You all know, I think most everybody knows where Sumac is, the upper part of the Rio Ansu watershed. Incredible amount of diversity, herpetologically speaking, in this transition zone of the Piedmont foothills of the Andes. Almost 130 species of reptiles and amphibians now registered, which is really incredible. Um, <clears throat> we're located in the, the um, Yanganati Sangai Ecological Corridor, at the very bottom of the corridor, the, the lowest part. The area receives an immense amount of rain, up to 5,500 millimeters a year. Pretty stable temperatures year-round, kind of alternating between average 19 and 21 degrees Celsius. Daytime highs up to 26 degrees Celsius, 27 degrees. Nighttime lows down to 16, 17 degrees Celsius. So not really a huge temperature range there anyway. As you can see in the map, um, you can't really see too well. That will help turn up my brightness. We've got uh, the Sumac Kasai Reserve right here and a cluster of other reserves in this, in this watershed. Really important area for, uh, for biodiversity. So I first came, I think many of you know, I came to Ecuador in 2015 as part of a study abroad program that involved a research component. I went and designed my own project and carried it out here at Sumac Calci in C2 studying these Bothracophia snakes, which were previously thought to be pretty rare. In the course of three weeks, I found five snakes. I was like, wow, this is pretty incredible. I should come back here again and, and do a, a more thorough study of this, of these snakes, because they are, they're here and I could really get a good sample size out of this. So I came back and uh, 2018 with a group of three others, four of us, with the object uh, objectives and goals here um, given. So looking at, we wanted to assess habitat preference, um, at how that relates to forest stage and wet and dry areas, distribution activity, abundance, um, diet, influence of temperature, climate, and president presence of human activity, basically all ecological parameters, everything relating to natural history, etc. So those were our objectives and we developed a methodology using transects, each 200 meters long. We had a, a highland study site and a lowland study site separated by an elevation of about two or three hundred meters about a thousand feet in elevation difference. Within each of these two larger study sites there were three um, more, more or less quadrats or parcellas, uh, 
one in the primary forest, one in the secondary forest, and one in the, the agricultural area. Within each of these larger areas, there were three transects, a dry transect, a creek transect, and a river transect. And that makes a total of 18 transects, and we did standardized sampling on these transects of an hour long in the morning, in the afternoon, and in the night, alternating in between the four investigators so that each person at the end of the day did an equal number on each transect in the morning, night, and afternoon. We did a total of 108 per person, 432 total transect hours surveyed. To do a transect, you go out, you get to the beginning, you register the temperature, the humidity, the climate, and you spend one hour looking. Um, oop, skipped a video there. One hour looking, uh, registering all the herbs you can find, and then at the end you take the temperature, humidity, climate again. That's the gist of it. So, looking at some of the results here, um, and I must note that these stats are not actually up to date. Um, in the last four days, we have found four more Bothrocophius. Now have a total sample size of 45, which is pretty incredible. Um, most of the stats here are based on a sample size of 40 or less. So looking at um, hour of encounter, time we found these snakes is really spread across the board. It seems like more or less you can find these snakes at any time of day. Really interesting that we have, um, you can see in white there, the active individuals versus in gray, the, the individuals that are coiled. Around 10 a.m. we have a lot of encounters with active individuals, not, um, I'm not exactly sure what the cause of that is. And then again at night, a good number of active individuals. But overall we can just see that um, these snakes are, they're out there and at all times, basically all, all parts of the day. Um, we look at temperature, not any huge trends, although actually, well, there's a significant difference between the temperature between the snakes and the afternoon and the snakes and night. Um, this is a Wilcox and all pairs non-parametric test. Uh, sample size for the Bothrocophius was, oh, I see I never put that in there, Tem probably, around tw probably around 35, something like that. Um, <clears throat> We see that the temperature is not significantly different between the snakes in the morning. Um, the snakes here in the morning, which is interesting because most of the snakes we found were in the morning. But frankly, I really don't think there's a significant difference or a significant influence here of temperature. The temperature range present in this area is within the operating conditions of these snakes. And we see, I mean, a lot of activity at night with the snakes too. It's significantly cold, cooler than the normal temperature when the snakes are found. But I really, again, I don't think there's a huge influence. Just something interesting to point out. So if we look at selection habitat as a whole overall, um, <clears throat> we see some interesting things because these snakes were previously documented to be mainly in primary forests, and that's for Bothrocophius microphthalmus. Hyaprora had been reported to, in some agricultural areas, some secondary forests, but also a lot in primary forests. Well, um, we wanted to test this more because, as you, many of you know, biologists love primary forests and have to wonder if those sampling efforts were made equally between other habitats. And so we did some equally sam um, some some more standardized sampling. And well, just overall for 40 snakes, uh, we found that 43 percent of the snakes were in, in secondary forest. And actually, with the more recent encounters, that number would be higher. Four of our or three of our newer snakes, four or four of our newer snakes were found in the secondary forest. Also, the snakes are clearly uh, present in Bosque, in the primary forest, 38%. Um, that's probably a little bit high because our sampling, our just non-standardized sampling efforts are are definitely a little heavy on the on, on that side. And then the cultivated area is probably also underrepresented be, because um, visibility is so low in the grass. So there's probably actually more snakes than just 20%. But if we look at our standardized sampling here over on the right, um, that's with a sample size of 12 out of 432 hours of looking at roughly 36, um, roughly an average of one snake every 36 hours. So you don't just find them willy-nilly, but they're definitely out there. Um, 
again, here we see that there is more. Um, there is a trend towards boss uh, secondary forest. Now, I didn't do any statistical analysis. These are just some simple, um, simple abundance stats here. And we also see though that the snakes are found by creeks. 50% found in creeks. Another 33% 30 another third of the snakes found by rivers. So if you just group those together um, as kind of water habitats, we're finding a lot of snakes near water. Now we wanted to take that, oh, we'll talk a little bit about diet here because, well, in thinking about what might drive this selection, diet is one very plausible explanation or at least plays a part. So <clears throat> we look here at some of our previous diet, can't do that, sorry. Some of our previous dietary records there in that table up top, we see microphthalmus has been, um, Reget has, has been reported to eat two species of frogs in that photo, though the, those are actually registers from the Ansu, Juan Pablo and I. Um, then there was a mar, uh, that Noctivagus is actually a, a possum, small mammal, and a teed lizard. High Perura has a, has a more varied diet, or at least from what we've registered, including a snake, including a centipede, a rat, um, two small gymnothalmid lizards, and um, a couple of frogs as well. So pretty varied diet there. It looks like they are preying pretty heavily on small ectothermic prey, as in, sna as in um, lizards and frogs. So that's really interesting. And some more supporting evidence for that is a is a behavior that we registered here in the Ansu for the first time in the genus. It's called caudal luring. You can see the snake is w wiggling its tail. Uh, this video seems to be lagging a little bit. Uh, but you can kind of see that tail has a yellow coloration. Um, let's see if we can play that again. Wiggling the tail there on a log jam over a river. That log jam um, probably serves as a bridge for small uh, lizards, frogs to cross the creek. Snake is posted up perfectly in front of it, wiggling its tail like a worm. That attracts small ectothermic prey. This is a well-documented behavior in other viparid snakes, um, and it is known to be specifically targeting um, small ectothermic prey. Okay, so interesting. We look at potential prey availability. These are numbers, just pure numbers of relative abundance that we drew from our transect surveys. For frogs there on the left, uh, we see a lot of frogs in the cultivated area. Same thing with the lizards. And then kind of split up um, nothing, no super apparent trends there for the frogs, a lot of them in the, the dry areas. A lot of lizards actually in the creeks as well. These are those small gymnothalmid um, uh, stream lizards, Potomites ecbleopus and strangulatus. Ecbleopus is a registered um, prey item of Hyaprora, and I think it's likely that these, these Botrocophia snakes are predating those stream lizards a decent bit. Now we wanted to look at attraction to water a little bit more in depth because this is something that was registered in high prior previously with the very few reports that existed. Um, and so we wanted to test that hypothesis. And this is with a sample size of 37 snakes. We see that actually about half of them, um, about half of these snakes were found within 0 and 15 meters of a water source. Okay, now that seems like a lot, uh, anecdotally, but you have to ask yourself, what is the frequency of water? Because if there's a water source every 15 or 20 meters, well, then maybe there's not really a preference there. <sighs> so that um, that's it. it comes out to an average of about 16, um, a distance of 16 meters from a water source for those snakes, all right? So I wanted to analyze this a little bit further, and I'm going to explain this somewhat complicated looking illustration here. These uh, here on the left side are our transects. Each white bar represents one transect 200 meters long, and each black little bar represents a water source. So we went along on all of these transects and registered the water sources that were present there. Registered a total of 32 water sources out of the 18 transects. That, if you put those transects end to end, that would make 18 transects 200 meters each, a total of 3,600 meters of transects. 
32 out of 3,600 meters. That's an average of about a f one water source every 112.5 meters. Oy. As you can see right there. All right. So, again, just anecdotally, that seems like a big difference from the average Botrocophius of 16. Um, but I wanted to test this even a little bit further. So, down here is our line of transects end to end from 0 to 3,600. Okay. And what I did was went through and generated random numbers along that line. Um, 37 random numbers, the same sample size as that of the Bolterkofius. And I, then I took those numbers and I threw them down on our one long transect. And then I, you can see that, that white bar has those black little bars in between. Those again are those water sources. Okay, so for each random number I threw down, I measured the distance to the closest water source. I'm going to go out. So here, for instance, this little arrow is pretty close to that water source. So I measured that. This one here, closer to that water source. I measured that distance. Came up with 37 distances, just like the snakes. And... I took an average of that and then did a statistical comparison of those averages. So here we have on the right side the Botharcophia snakes, their distance with the box plot, and then Aleatorio is random. So those are the random numbers, the distance to the closest water source for just a random number if there was no preference per se and we were just assessing... um, yeah, the distance for, for the snakes without any preference. It would perhaps be something similar to this. We, cu- we get an average of, of 44 meters for those random numbers distance from, um, from water source. Running a statistical analysis, so we see that that is that's a, a two-sample test, a normal approximation, approximation but also then a one-way chi-squared analysis. Um, we see both of those come out with, as a, with a very statistically significant difference, which indicates to us that these snakes are selecting this habitat. It seems like they are significantly closer to water sources than what they would be if there was no preference and they were just randomly distributed throughout the forest, if that makes sense. Now, we observe something really interesting here. Um... <clears throat> 61% of the snakes that we found were, were rolled up, were coiled. 39% were active. You see two photos there demonstrating more or less those two different um, activity patterns or positions. And what we found is that when it's stormy outside, that's what tempested, tempested means, um, when it's stormy outside, almost all of the snakes that we find are active. You see there in the blue on the, on the graph, um, This is a a contingency analysis. Um, So when it's stormy outside, most of the snakes we find are active on the move. When it's not stormy outside, um, a lot of the snakes are just coiled. So when it's not stormy, you know, maybe foggy, maybe a little bit of rain, maybe cloud, most of the time cloudy, maybe even sunny. When I say stormy, I mean wind, rain, sometimes hail. and let, and let me tell you, when it gets stormy, it can really get stormy. So we asked ourselves, why are the snakes moving when it's stormy? Okay, and again, those, those differences are pretty significant there from Fisher's exact, exact test, Pearson's, and the likelihood ratio from the chi-squared. Um, so, so, dang, my illustrations are not coming up in order like I wanted, but anyway... So here, looking at the bottom illustration there, we're right there at the foothills of the Andes, and there's something called a rain shadow effect. All the weather that's generated in the lower Amazon, a lot of uh, water that's sucked up, turned into clouds, and those clouds get pushed up into the Andes where they get halted, and they drop all their rain right there on the foothills on the eastern verse into the Andes. So we get a lot, a lot of rain. And sometimes when it rains, it rains hard. Oh, man. So... That illustration, again, did not come out like it was supposed to, but um, that was a video there. <laughs> I can just bring this to the front here really quickly. You can see when it rains hard, when this happens, it, act, it really, really rains, and the rivers flood. 
okay? So you can imagine if you're a snake and you're coiled up on the side of a river or a creek, and we've seen now that these snakes seem to, they seem to prefer water and they coil by it. Okay, so if you're coiled by the water, it starts to rain really, really heavy in an area that frequently gets flash floods. Well, what do you want to do? You don't want to just hang out there, right? So, um, so what we see actually really interesting, when it's stormy, again, on the right side we see that when it is stormy, the distance from a water source for these snakes is greater. There's also a greater span, range of that data. When it's not stormy outside, the snakes are closer to the water with an average of just over 10, 10 meters, okay? So really interesting, um, this was a, another Wilcoxon analysis there, and we see that those differences are significant. Um, so it seems like storm, when it's stormy, snakes active and further from water. When it's not stormy, snakes coiled and closer to water. Really interesting. Okay, moving on, we also now analyzed... Um, vegetative cover for these snakes using a spherical densiometer uh, to make a long story short this apparatus registers the openness of a canopy it registers the density of the of the canopy and the, and the vegetation and you basically count the open spots using those little squares on the mirror right so you get a number between 1 and 96 and 96 being a very very open area one being ex entirely closed area. So every time we encountered a snake we measured the canopy coverage and then on all of our transects we made it, measured the canopy coverage every 10 meters to get an idea of what what the canopy coverage is like more or less in these different habitats. Okay. So we see here uh, <coughs> excuse me this is a <coughs> This is a Wilcoxon's all-pair analysis of these averages, again, with the box plot and the green line representing the, the, the mean. Um, we actually see significant differences between the habitat types. Um, even the primary and secondary were different, the secondary being a little bit more closed. The snakes, ha the, the coverage for the snakes, the BM there, was significantly different from the primary and the secondary forest. Um, but not from the cultivated area, which is interesting. Now, um, what I need to do is a, a direct analysis of the snakes that were found in the primary and secondary forest to see if that was significantly different from those two habitats. But for now, um, one conjecture of mine is that, well, if the snakes are in a significantly more open area in general than the primary and secondary forest, but most of the snakes are found in those two habitats, um, within those habitats they are most likely selecting open areas more open than is just the the average or the normal within that habitat type okay so we ask ourselves why are they selecting more open areas potentially a more open area allows for more vegetative growth it attracts more insects that then attract more frogs lizards small mammals it's just a more dynamic um, kind of micro habitat within a, a forest it's a forest that's very heterogeneous, but it, it's almost um, one of those like little heterogeneous hotspots. Um, that's one possible explanation. We look at um, looking down here at the Bothrocophius. Uh, that illustration's a little messed up too. Those numbers are not coming up well. Those sample sizes here. Let me just explain. This is actually. Uh, 32, 120, 120, we're t we've got our snakes here, our creeks, our river, and our dry area. The snakes were found to have a, um, be, have a significant difference from the creeks in the Seco area, significantly more open than those two habitats, but not from the, the rivers, which uh, is interesting. So, talking a little bit more about activity patterns and then position as it relates to canopy coverage. This is really interesting. We see that, again, um, the, the coiled snakes there on the left have a smaller range of data and a lower canopy coverage, whereas the active snakes, that average is much higher, but it's also, if you look at the span of the data, the spread, the spread of the data is much greater as well, which is interesting, right? We can imagine that a snake that's on the move um, and our 
our hypothesis here is that a snake on the move is not act actively selecting its habitat. It's moving to another place to coil. So if you're just a snake moving to find another coil location, you're going to be passing through a variety of conditions, a variety of habitats, more open areas, some closed areas. You're going to have a greater variety uh, of conditions that you move through until you reach an area that you select. And that's possibly what this is indicating to us here with that greater spread of data. Again, also these differences are significant. But in terms of just talking about spread of data, I wanted to just do a simple analysis of that, looking at sample variants for these snakes. Across the board, looking first at a vegetative cover, we actually see a really significant difference, or a really large difference here between the active snakes on the bottom, um, the, the, the sample variance of their vegetative cover 670 versus a, a variance of 87 and a half for the coiled snakes. Okay, so a very small variance there for the coiled snakes indicates that that's a range, they're selecting uh, conditions within that range. Okay, we also see just interestingly temperature, uh, the variance is also higher for active snakes. Proximity to water, again, uh, variance is higher for active snakes. So again, just might indicate that there's actually selection, ha active selection going on on the part of these snakes. Now, again, I'm talking about coverage here, but not just vegetative coverage. When I say cobertura, I'm talking about um, the coverage of things right overhead over the snake. So for instance, a, a leaf, a trunk or something. So thinking about the snake selecting an area that's that's kind of hidden for them. Um, these snakes are predated by a lot of birds. So, you know, one might think that they possibly would select areas with a little overhead coverage to decrease their visibility on the, for, for, the, for their predators, right? We see actually about half and half, half of the snakes little over half are found with something covering them overhead, some leaf or something, and then uh, about half are, don't have anything overhead. Okay, we do another contingency analysis of this, and with thir out of 36 snakes, we see that um, when there is coverage present there on the left side, it's mostly with coiled snakes, okay? Now, when there's no coverage present, the majority of snakes are active, actually active, like you can imagine a snake crossing the road, there's nothing overhead. Okay, we see that those differences are significant, so it seems like active snakes in general have less coverage overhead, but the majority of coiled snakes do have coverage, which indicates a snake, when it goes and coils, is probably finding, is probably going to coil up underneath something so as to, to hide itself a little bit. <laughs> Regarding that same subject, more or less, of um, avoiding predation, we think about camouflage. And these snakes just naturally have really good camouflage. We find about 61% are camouflaged. That was just a qualitative assessment based on whether or not they match the background where, um, where they were. Okay, um, So these snakes, they, they do just, by chance, uh, end up having a lot of camouflage with many of the backgrounds where they are. I mean, a lot of... A large part of this, the forest is just dead leaves, and of course they camouflage wonderfully with that. We actually don't really find a significant difference here between active snakes and coiled snakes and whether there is camouflage or not. Um, in general, coiled snakes do have a little bit more um, cam are camouflaged more often than active snakes are, but again, this difference is not significant. I really don't think camouflage matters that that much. Um, more coverage. And at that point, they, they're usually pretty good. They probably don't usually need to select um, camouflage. Now, one interesting thing, we almost never find snakes that bo lack both coverage and camouflage. Are neither They neither have anything above them and are also not camouflaged. The very few examples that fit this category are moving snakes and snakes like crossing the road, for instance. Um, so that is somewhat interesting. Now, concerning the, the topic of microthalamus and hyaprora and this zone of sympatry and what's really going on between these two, two very similar snakes, um, I must preface this by saying that the microthalamus and hyaprora are extremely similar. They look almost exactly the same, and just at face value, you cannot tell them apart. 
The only way to differentiate them is by the morphology of their hemipenes, uh, number of spines on their hemipenes, for instance, and then the number of scales, different scales. Let's talk a little bit here. So basically, sympatric zones have been have been registered in various areas now. I think three or four. Uh, and Jorge Vaca did his thesis in 2012 on systematics of me, of Botrocophius, and he proposed that hecho que podría seguir la existencia de áreas de hibridismo. So there might be, he says, there probably are areas of hybridism. Okay. Well, here we have a profile for one of our snakes. You can see, come out here. Okay, so these are the ventral scales here on the belly. These are subcaudal scales. So Microthalmus has a greater number of ventral scales and a greater number of subcaudal scales. Another important difference here, these scales, whether they're divided or whether they're single, okay? Hyaprora has single, Microthalmus has divided scales, okay? And then there's also some differences on the head scalation numbers of head scales, like intercantales, intrasuperaculares, sublabiales, and for lab. And so, yeah, number of different scales. Now, we started asking ourselves what's really going on with the snakes here in the Ansu. Is hybridism possible? Do we have more hyaprora, more microthalmos? What do we have? So we started catching snakes and counting their scales. So if we look at ventral scales here, we see, um, yeah, I've given here the, the range of scale counts for hyaprora on the left and microphthalmus on the right, and there's just one scale difference there that 137 is um, neither belongs to microphthalmus nor hyaprora, but we find that have found three snakes in our region that have 137 ventral scales. We've got some more hyaprora-ish individuals with 136 ventrals. And then the majority, 19 microphthalmus, more, yeah, in that range of, of microphthalmus, but we see overlap there. Now, um, here these are subcaudal scales. Um, on the left, hyaprora. On the right, microphthalmus. Um, and there's actually that green zone. There's an area of of um, overlap there because I think microthalamus comes down to four. The range for microthalamus is 48 to to 60. The range for hyaprora is like 41 to 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 50 or something like that. Um, but anyway, we see that the snakes that are oh excuse me, it's actually. It's actually that green zone is the exact zone of overlap. So, so for microthalmus, it's like 46 to 60, and then hyaprora is like 41 to 52, and then the bars at the top just indicate the pure hyaprora zone and the pure microthalmus zone. So we see there on the left that we actually registered four individuals that were just straight up hyaprora. On the right side, three individuals that were just microthalmus, but the majority of the snakes we found were in that overlap zone right there in the middle, 14 individuals that are possibly hybrids. So, just interesting. Looking at more at subcaudals, I mentioned that um, the difference between um, single and divided. So you see there, you've got junta, or the single scales, divided. Now, in theory, if you have a hyaprora, it's going to have all just single scales. In theory, a microthalmus all just divided. What we find is that in the Ansu, there's a mix. In fact, 90% of the snakes we find have some mix. They have some number of divided and some number of singles. Okay, most of the snakes have a majority divided scales. That's 67%. Some of them, 10%, have all divided scales, which would be almost more exclusively microphthalmus. Um, so if we do the breakdown of those scale counts, we see again it's just this uh, basically a gradient on that left side more hyaprora on that right side more microphthalmus -y, um, but with a mix of both divided and and single scales so really interesting we just have to ask ourselves what's really going on here with these snakes are they hybridizing are they different species to begin with because we look at these different measures of basically their whether or not their species our main measures are one on the genetic level, but just markers that, uh, you know, genetic 
markers that have been identified, but what do those really mean? How do we know that we've identified important genetic markers and important sequences um, to differentiate between? And then aside from that, we're talking about differences in number of scales and differences in the number of spines and their hemipenes. What do spines and the hemipenes really, really matter if they're still able to interbreed and produce viable offspring? And what do number of scales really, really mean? These are almost just superficial morphological characters. So that's really the bigger question here. Now, scaling back a little bit just in conclusion on all of these different points, um, looking at habitat, um, it seems that just in overall these snakes really inhabit inhabit a variety of different habitats. Um, they can be found across the board in many, many different areas. Within that spread, though, there is perhaps somewhat of a preference for secondary forest. An explanation for that I'm still trying to figure out. Not entirely sure, but say just in general, these snakes are, are out there and in a lot of different habitats. So I would, I would probably almost refer to them to, as a generalist. And um, The preference for, uh, for, for water is very interesting, and that does seem, that, that's a preference that I'm fairly confident in that that is a significant um, trend and an actual trend there. I think these snakes are selecting that. Those habitats, I think a lot of that is driven by di dietary um, reasons. So I think these snakes are eating a lot of frogs and lizards, and interestingly, I think that trend um, is true for, for adults too. However, there's probably somewhat of a dietary shift throughout the life of the snakes t more towards mammals with the larger individuals. Now, an analysis that I have not yet completed uh, um, and have not yet included in this uh, presentation is that anecdotally I have observed that larger snakes seem to be further from water um, which is a trend we see in other viparid snakes uh, where younger individuals feed more on ectothermic prey and as they get larger they um, shift to feeding on more mammalian prey which perhaps would be in drier areas or not as closely associated to water okay so that is a possible trend I've, that I'm about actually going to analyze today and um, so there, there may be somewhat of an ontod, um, ontological shift there for these snakes, but in general, they're, they're eating a lot of ectothermic prey, it seems like, and even one um, adult registered caught a luring, so the adults are still actively predating ectothermic prey. In terms of activity, it seems these snakes are very active. They move frequently, um, and it seems that that, that activity it, can be pretty closely associated to um, stormy conditions, to stormy weather. It gets them moving. It makes sense if they coil next to water in an area that flash floods and it starts to rain heavily, move to higher ground, relocate. Um, so not only does the evidence indicate that, but it, it just makes sense from a, a standpoint, a fecundity a standpoint too because if you don't move you're gonna get swept away and die and so this over time the snakes that figure out to go to higher ground when it floods are gonna be the ones that survive and reproduce um, so that makes sense in terms of hybridism this is still early on in in the um, course of things in that study so we're still trying to figure out what's going on just based on scale counts and um, you know, what, more or less what we know about these snakes as being pretty similar species. I think it's very, very likely that they are hybridizing. Um, I don't have enough evidence or grounds right now to make any really taxonomic, um, hard taxonomic assertions, um, but I, I have a feeling that maybe a subspecies qualification would be more appropriate for these snakes. Um, we'll have to do some more genetic analyses, continue to assess the scale counts, do some hemipene analyses as well, and then hopefully relate that to habitat selection and distribution if possible. So all in all, we're finding some really, really interesting things with these snakes. I'm very pleased that we've been able to find so many, um, and we now even have more snakes so we'll continue to to reassess these hypotheses and theories as um, as we make more observations but for now super interesting project and uh, some of my references and um, questions so 
presentation went really, really well at the university. I was super pleased, got a lot of very positive feedback. Some good, we had a good conversation with questions after the presentation. And then following that, people came up and congratulated me and were really pleased with my work. So pretty happy about this, pretty stoked about it. Um, really, really interesting. And now I just got to sit my ass down and do some writing. So...